think so. Hey, we're right at three o'clock. Welcome everyone. Hello and welcome to Introduction to Teaching and Thinking with AI. I'm Anwar Hijaz. I'm Associate Faculty in Political Science at Saddleback College and Faculty Support at CVC. I'm really excited to introduce our facilitator today, Jose Antonio Bowen. Jose has won many teaching awards, including at Stanford and Georgetown. He was a dean at Miami and Southern Methodist University and the president of Goucher College. He has written over a hundred scholarly articles and is the author of many books, including the most recent, Teaching with AI, A Practical Guide to a New Era of Human Learning with Edwards Watson. Stanford honored him as a distinguished alumni scholar, and he has presented keynotes and workshops at more than 400 campuses and conferences in 46 states and 20 countries around the world. He's now a senior fellow for the American Association of Colleges and Universities, and is also does innovation and inclusion consulting for a wide variety of Fortune 500 companies. During this webinar, we'll share a survey link for your feedback. We will be posting in the chat around the 40 minute mark and every 15 minutes afterwards. Please complete it to allow At One to improve for future pro programming. And then while At One doesn't offer badges for this webinar, if you need proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, stay till the end, complete the survey and request a copy of your responses via um, the Google form. And this can serve as your confirmation. And this webinar will be recorded and a copy will be available at the at one uh, website. So with that, I will go ahead and um, pass it to Jose to begin. Great. Uh, so I'm hoping that everybody sees the poll since I see there are more participants than, um, so there's a, there's a poll there. So if you want to um, take a second to answer that. Uh, so this is the first of four uh, but luckily we've split them up so you don't have to do them all today. Um, so today we are gonna be uh, doing the intro, uh, talking about some general principles. I will be introducing some ideas about um, AI literacy. Um, and then the next uh, time, I think it's next week, can't remember, uh, or two weeks, we'll be doing a deeper dive, more tools, um, lots of cool things that will make your workload and your life better, promise, and some things that will also scare you to death. Um, and then we'll talk about, we'll have a whole session on cheating, academic dishonesty, ethics, uh, a policy, um, how to craft policies for class, et cetera. And then the last session is all about assignments, um, a little bit about assessment. Um, yes, you will never have to sit on that committee where you read all of the essays from freshman year again to spot check them for an accreditation report. AI can actually do your accreditation report um, that will make your life better. It can also do your department schedule. So there are some things that it um, can do to help. Um, and so I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, I have also put in the chat, um, I will do it again now, a, a link to the slide citations and the slides. So um, yes, I'm a faculty member. My daughter used to say, dad, you don't have to speak in paragraphs with footnotes when you're just talking to me. Um, so, uh, but if you want 41 pages of citations um, for today, and actually it's for the whole set, and I will update them. So that's, I, I do only one set because it's just too much work to update uh, a dozen presentations. Um, okay, so it looks like we've got a good response on the poll. So I'm gonna end the poll if we can actually, so if you can end the poll and, and share it so we can all see it. Um, there we go. Um, so, so let me say a couple of things about uh, this. So you were able to do multiple answer, I'm hoping, I think. So um, So the good news is somebody selected everything um, because I think that uh, if you didn't select almost everything, uh, I don't understand um, because right, all of these things are issues, right? Absolutely everything on this uh, is an issue. Now, you may be thinking, well, okay, uh, all of this is new for AI, uh, but guess where I got this list? Yes, this is the list from Wikipedia of all the problems we had with Wikipedia. Um, it's actually the same list that was generated about the internet. Um, it was this; these were the top faculty concerns about the internet. So, 
that's not to say there's a problem. I mean, so look, the truth is all of these things are concerns. Um, they should be concerns. Um, they were concerns before, and they're concerns now. So there's some good news there because it means that we are the people who can deal with this, right? Everything on this list is something that we think about, right? We think about all of these things. We are the right people uh, to answer these questions. Um, but I will say two uh, two other things with with regards uh, to to that. Um, the first is about the environment. So you, the AI is going to use more energy. Um, it's yet one more thing, but that's the way to think about it. It is yet one more thing. Um, so the reason that Microsoft wants to buy a nuclear reactor is not because AI is the largest user of energy. It's because AI does use energy and Microsoft was trying to reduce the amount of energy. And the truth is you were using a ton of energy every time you use Microsoft Word, especially if you use cloud or if you store pictures in the clouds. Um, so you can see here, there's actually a comparison um, of the watt hours. Um, and so, right, net, watching, watching streaming video is much more energy intensive uh, than doing um, AI prompts. Um, and of course, Bitcoin, this is a logarithmic scale. So none of that to say that um, we shouldn't be concerned about this, uh, but you know, there's the amount of CO2 emitted from an AI prompt, um, right? And uh, if you've had a cup of coffee this morning, uh, you use considerably more, uh, and if you had a disposable cup, even more. Um, so again, not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about AI, uh, but we should actually put it in context and we should be concerned about all these things. I do find this interesting that somebody actually just published a study um, that found that your typing a page of writing uses significantly more carbon than asking AI because your computer is on for extended amount of time. And of course, if you have a cup of coffee, I guess this gets worse. Um, so uh, if you really wanted to reduce your, your use of data centers, which is the problem, um, the biggest thing you could do is we could all stop streaming Netflix because video YouTube um, is uh, a significant user of, of data centers. Again, not, not at all to, to minimize those needs as a, as a person who doesn't have any plastic. I don't have shampoo or deodorant or any or toothpaste. None of those things come out of plastic in my house. Um, so, but, uh, uh, but, but yeah, so just, just a little context. Um, the same point about privacy. So if you saw these privacy warnings, right? Personal information is sold or rented to third parties, uh, right? Are, is anybody here worried about this list? Um, right? Uh, you should be worried about everything on this list, right? But but uh, the things that you should be worried about are both Canvas and, Canvas and Blackboard, both get C ratings from the privacy because they do all of these things. Uh, and of course, there are other things, um, right? Of course, Google, Facebook, right? They're, they all, all of these things are the same privacy warning um, from, a, I think it's called, uh, what's the name of this website? Um, common, common Sense Privacy. Um, but of course, your car, right? Everything you say in your car, including a rental car, um, belongs to the car company, all the intellectual property. That's why when you're in a car and then you mention that you need cat litter, you get an ad the next morning on your Google search for cat litter because some the, your car company sold that. They also sold all of your driving habits, by the way, too. Um, and then there's some weird ones, like just checking the weather. Um, so if you're a weather checker, they know that. So, so, um, so, so none of this to, to, to minimize these, 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 um, these problems, but to say we should put them in context that we actually have a whole range of privacy issues uh, we should be concerned about. But there's one more about AI, um, which is that AI, the way that it works, right? A Google search, it stores all of your search. Google is set up to do that. A, a, a chatbot is not set up to do that because they don't want you pissing in the well, right? They don't want you to mess with their model. And so if you if AI learned everything that you did, it would be constantly saying, oh, you said that Will Smith wrote Hamlet and it would be it would be constantly rewriting its knowledge. So it turns out it doesn't actually have any knowledge base, which is an important thing about using AI. It doesn't know anything. So on the one hand, that's a little bit better for privacy, a little bit. Uh, right? Nothing is risk free. Uh, it's a little bit better for privacy, but it's worse for accuracy because it means that AI, right, doesn't have a knowledge base. It's just telling you what other people predict it would say. 
Um, so I start with that just, just to sort of set some groundwork. So, um, because AI is a weird technology. It is in some ways like the internet and we have the similar concerns, but it's also very different. Um, and so here's what we're gonna do uh, today and over the next couple of weeks. Um, today, we're gonna talk about how AI is already changing working and thinking. Um, think about, and you say, well, how's AI gonna change thinking? Well, think about a map. If I gave you a map, right, of your city or whatever, it, and then I take it away, it's changed the way that you think, right? Notice that you now think about your neighborhood or your city differently because you've seen the map. You now visualize and think about the city differently. It's changed your thinking. But if I give you GPS and then I take the GPS away, you're just lost. In other words, the map makes you smarter. GPS does not. And so those are different types of cognitive artifacts. They both change your thinking, one for the better, one for the worse. It's not clear which AI is going to be yet. It might change our thinking for better, but it might change it for the worse. But we have to understand how that's already happening. Second, we'll talk about uh, communication relationships. AI doesn't have empathy, but it makes you think it has empathy, which is both scary and useful. And sentiment analysis, AI is really pretty good at it. There are a whole set of new tools that can tell you, tell you when a student is confused or unhappy um, or getting right answers, but not engaged. That's interesting. Uh, so we have to learn a little bit about the AI ecosystem. What are the different types of tools? They come in two different categories you should know about. Um, and that will get us to some ways of reconceptualizing. So AI is gonna change average. It's gonna change your grading because if you give students a C for work that has lots of spelling mistakes, right? And say, well, you just run, no, I don't do that. I'd run it through a spell checker. Right, the spell checking technology meant we no longer tolerate certain kinds of mistakes. We just say, use a spell checker, those red lines, pay attention. Um, and now with Grammarly, we're starting to see that you should not have those grammatical mistakes. So it's changed what we tolerate. So AI is gonna do this many more fold and it's doing it already in the workplace. So students who do only C-level work or average, the work that AI can do will no longer get jobs because there aren't any more jobs right, for people who spend all day looking up words in a dictionary. There's no jobs for that. Um, the next creativity, AI is gonna make us all more creative. That's weird. Uh, and so we have to understand how that works. It's very counterintuitive. Uh, and then as I said, we're gonna spend an entire session on new kinds of assignments and assessments. Um, look, we AI should make our teaching better in the same way that COVID made our teaching better, right? I mean, hopefully, right, COVID, COVID was a pain in the butt, <laughs> but at the end of the day, right, we did learn some things, we did change some things, and so maybe AI could work some of the same way. So that's the plan. Uh, the chat is available. When you have questions, you can raise your hand and someone will unmute you. Uh, I've got lots of examples and some things for you to play with in a couple of minutes. Uh, so um, let's start with how AI is changing working and thinking, and then we'll experiment a little bit ourselves. Um, so there's some things that AI can already do better. Um, one of them is radiology uh, and it's getting better all the time. So, right, you you want the the, the AI mammogram. Um, my wife has had one of these and she asks me to tell you that this is not her mammogram, just in case anybody was wondering, no, this is one from a journal. Uh, I did not use that, right? But we know it's and it, because she got the results before she got out of the elevator, right? I mean, she literally had the mammogram, got in the elevator and then boom, there are the results. Um, and it turns out the, right, it's better than having a radiologist look at it. And we say, well, how can that be? Well, part of that's because humans are noisy thinkers, right? We, we, we don't think the same way all day long, right? After a bad lunch, you give harder grades. Um, uh, we know from studies of federal judges that if their sports team loses on Sunday, they give harsher sentences, right? You don't wanna be the last person before lunch because your brain is expensive. The judgment part of your brain uses a lot of energy. And so as you get tired, you take shortcuts. And so when you're grading papers all afternoon, right, you're, 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 you're better right after a meal. And then as the afternoon wears on, right, there's just variation. It's the same is true for radiologists. So this has been going on for a dozen years. This is not 
chatbot new chat GPT technology. This is the this is from the Journal of, of Radiology and Artificial Intelligence. Um, so this has been going on for some time, uh, but it 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 shows us that AI can actually find problems and do diagnosis. Um, but no more recently in this study, um, um, actors playing patients um, were were texting live with with Google's uh, new medical AI, um, or they were with human doctors and they weren't told which. And then they had another group of human doctors that listened to the conversations, um, and they rated the AI as better on twenty eight out of thirty two characteristics. Right? They said AI is 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 better. It's more empathetic. It's giving better diagnosis, um, and the patients agreed as well. So this is before for Omni that came out in May that has emotional intelligence. So this is just unemotional, un unemotionally intelligent old chat GPT four. Um, so AI can be good at diagnosis. That's interesting. So the good news here is that senior lawyers are still better than AI and junior lawyers, right? Experts still have value. Yay us as experts. Um, as you can see from this chart though, so senior lawyers, experts are still better at the task, but junior lawyers are not. AI is better than the junior lawyers. And so um, this product called Co-Counsel, $400 a month if you're interested, so you can do more of what AI can't. So think about this. If you're an expert, you're an expert lawyer, an expert anthropologist, an expert scientist, there are some things that AI could help you do today so you could do more of the other stuff, right? AI could write some emails for you, do the department schedule, uh, et cetera. Uh, write some, a research grant, reformulate your proposal, right? But that's, that's good. But notice that the internship apocalypse is now heading our way. You've heard about the homework apocalypse? Well, get ready for the internship apocalypse. That's already started. Because again, if students can only do junior work and they're not very good at it and they make some mistakes, AI is already better at that. So why would you hire, right? So if, if I'm so if I'm an expert running a law firm, I can get rid of my interns and save money. But then I'll have no senior lawyers in 10 years because they have right. So the question for us is how how do we to help people become senior lawyers when there's no more junior lawyer jobs. And I think that's what businesses are going to come at us and ask us to do. They're going to say, you know, what's your problem? Not our problem. We're going to save money, right? Um, so so there's, you graduate people who are experts. Thanks. Uh, but I, that's my prediction. Um, and so I think we're going to have to build internships into everything we do. I think we're going to have to have internships as a bigger part of college because the we've been relying on those paid internships for other people to do that piece of the educational job, um, the crafting of expertise. Um, so there, I, I already put a slide there. Um, okay. In this study, though, they they had AI do financial analysis and they they gave it the quarterly report and they went back to 1962 and said, here are the quarterly earnings, predict next quarter for the Fortune 500 companies. And of course we have the real data from human experts and, and chat GPT-4 was able to beat human experts um, consistently um, over this 50 plus year period. And they thought, well, but, but maybe AI already knows the answer. Maybe it cheated and it found it on the internet. So they said, okay, let's try next quarter. Right. Nobody knows what next quarter's earnings are going to be. And they got the same result. So here's the question. And there's something that we can learn about bias here. Why do you think that AI was better than humans at predicting financial earnings for next quarter? Why do you think AI was better? There are lots of potential reasons. They investigated things like, well, it's got a lot more data. It can it can crunch a lot more numbers. It can look at all sorts of other kinds of things. It has more data. But yes, somebody said it. Who let's see who is who got it? yes personal beliefs. Uh, um, Lauren, yes, it has no emotional bias. So when I say to you, how do you think Tesla is going to do next quarter? You think of Elon Musk, and now the way that you think about Elon Musk influences your right. It's just numbers. No, it's not. The way that you look at the numbers is influenced because you're a human by your emotional bias, 
right? Whether you like Elon Musk or not. So you're right. They concluded that the reason the AI was better was because it doesn't have that emotional bias. So what's interesting is that AI does have a bias, right? It amplifies the bias because it learned on the internet. So everything it learned on the internet is biased. So it learned all sorts of biases. But like with a human bias, if you know your bias, you can correct it. So if I know that I, like most humans, tend to grade papers that agree with me a little bit higher than papers that disagree with me and say I'm a jerk and everything I said in class was wrong, right? I, now I can say, okay, I'm not going to do that. I am going to grade the papers that, that disagree with me higher, but I'm going to have to spend energy working at that all afternoon. AI doesn't need that. And once you know the AI bias, you can correct it by just telling it. Grade papers that disagree with me higher, done. And it will do it. So this is interesting about AI is that it'll, it can, so which is why it's being used in HR, right? Because a search committee, we know a search committee has bias, right? We like people who think like us. But I could say to an AI, rank the candidates who were more likely to disagree with the current faculty members higher right? Rank candidates based solely on their publication history and their teaching record and ignore where they went to college. Right? That's really hard to do for humans because like, oh, you went to my alma mater. I like you. Oh, I feel, right? I feel good already. AI, I can eliminate that bias just by asking. So that's an interesting thing. AI does have bias, but once you know it, it's easier to eliminate, which means that we have to be teaching students about that bias, because good users of AI understand this, right? Um, but there's a problem here, which is that when physicians were given the opportunity to review cases, and they were either they were they were given the opportunity to use ChatGPT, right, to help them, it did make them faster. They were a little bit better at this is a diagnostic test, and they were a little bit better at diagnosis, but they weren't as good as AI alone, which the researchers concluded means they were reluctant to rely on AI for diagnosis, even though it was better. Well, that's not too surprising as humans were going to be right. We're, but when you don't know that AI did the did the diagnosis, it's okay, right? We saw that in the previous study. And we see the same thing for software. That when when Google coders are given here, there's a mistake in your software and they don't know it's AI, they're much more likely to accept the AI generated response because it's better. So, a, so Google is now using its own AI to fix its software um, better and faster than humans. Um, we're seeing this new drugs are being, right? This new study, a paradigm shift in drug discovery. They're looking for, um, right, any antibiotic resistant, uh, all sorts of, we're, we're gonna see new discovery because it can test a million things faster. But the last example here is that it's not just lawyers and doctors and scientists, it's chickens. Yes, every chicken is different. And so we've had to rely on humans to debone chickens until now. Now, deboning chickens is one of the worst factory jobs any human could have. And it would be a good thing for us no longer to have this. So that's interesting that we could not have to have humans do this really bad job. My guess is, is AI will also be able to pick up the trash um, and do some other kinds of things, which is interesting. Um, so, so think about which AI you've used, right? Uh, my guess is everybody's used ChatGPT and a few others. Um, this is the list that students, that high school students have used. So you see ChatGPT is up there, uh, but also Dolly, all right, some of them you probably aren't using. This is Bard, which is now uh, Gemini, right? Uh, rephrase AI. Yeah, I wonder what that one does. Uh, um, all right, so here's what I want you to do. I am now going to give you uh, another link. Um, and so we're going to try a couple of things. Again, we'll do a lot more of this uh, next time. Uh, but this is um, my website that has two things on it that will help you um, at whatever level I think you're at. Um, so if you're new to AI, I list the tools here in order and the, the big ones are in bold. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to do an exercise where you try the same prompt in multiple AI. So you can start to get to learn about their personalities. 
Um, if you're an advanced user and you already know the big three, you know, Claude, ChatGPT, and Gemini, um, then you can scroll further down and try some other tools. Um, if you want to do this in one window, you could use Chat Hub or Poe. Um, but I actually think it's better for you to, to create an account um, with these others. Um, the free Gemini is not so good. Uh, so if you're only using free tools, I would skip Gemini for now. But Claude and ChatGPT are both pretty good free tools. Um, back to privacy. So the irony here is that you should open up the settings and click on the don't use my data, right? Don't save my data. Again, it's not using your, nobody can extract your data, but they can use it for the next training of the next model, which you just may say, you know, I don't want you making money off my, my intellectual property. Um, but in order to do that, you have to log in, which is a little, right? There's an irony there. You have to log in to tell them not to use your data. Um, all right, so I would certainly try Claude and ChatGPT. Um, but then there's some other models that you may not know. Um, so if, you know, if, if you're on a, co a Microsoft campus, then forget ChatGPT, use Copilot, right? Because that will give you more data security. It should give you FERPA protection even if you want to upload student uh, data. Um, it depends on the campus. Talk to your IP, IT people first. Um, but Copilot is, your campus is paying for extra security. Hopefully they're getting it. Um, uh, if you're a scientist or a mathematician, Wolfram Alpha is the best at doing math because it doesn't use an AI for the math. It uses Wolfram Alpha, and then it has an AI wrapper. Um, if you're in the humanities, Latimer is a different AI because it's trained on black and brown sources that were licensed and verified. So it, it, it deals with both the ethical issue of licensed and verified. It's not taking anybody's stuff. Um, but it's also a different point of view because it's, right, Black and brown sources were, the, were, the, were what it was trained on. So it has a different way of looking at the world, as we'll see. Uh, I would also try Meta. That's, a, that's an open source, so you don't have to log in. So if you're worried about privacy or your students are worried about privacy, click on Meta and say, use this. You don't have to log in. Again, if you don't log in, you can't turn on the privacy controls. Um, and if you want to download it to your computer, uh, then you can do, all right, you can run the whole thing on your computer, which both should alleviate your energy concerns. Uh, but also it's the privacy, right? It's now it, nothing ever leaves your computer. You can turn off the internet and you can grade papers using an open source AI on your laptop. And then um, I would also try perplexity and we'll come back to the rest because perplexity um, is, is, is connected to the internet. And so it will give you links and other kinds of things. All right. So, so the first thing is you, you're going to need to try a couple of different, so open three or four different AI. But there are two reasons that people get confused about what AI can do. The first is they're using the wrong tool, right? These are, these are going to have different capabilities, right? So if you're using a hammer when you need a screwdriver, you're going to think, ah, this hammer's terrible. It's like, well, yeah, it's because you need a screwdriver, right? You're using the wrong tool. But the other reason, so I'm scrolling down here. I know you'll get a headache, but sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we go. There it is. You get to this little black box. So the other reason people get this wrong is because they're using prompts that are dumb, right? They say, so Einstein has shown up to help you cook dinner, but Einstein doesn't know how to boil an egg. He's Einstein. He knows other things, right? You're asking him the wrong thing. Don't ask him to boil eggs, right? So you've got to ask prompts that play to the strengths. If you want to know, you know, where was where was Lincoln shot? What year did this happen? Then do a Google search, right? You don't need it. You don't need an AI to give you data. And in fact, that data will probably be wrong because AI is not a right. It's not Wikipedia. It's not connected to a knowledge base, unless you do that, which we will do shortly. So here are a couple of easy prompts. So just pick one of these that you like, and then the idea of this page is that you can copy. You can just copy and paste, right? So I'm just gonna you know copy this. Uh, and then I'm going to go here uh, to Claude, and I'm going to paste it in there. And notice that I gave it some X's and Y's because I want you to customize this for two reasons. One is I've asked it about music history because that's what I teach. If that's not what you teach, you're not going to know if these answers are good or bad. So you've got to put in your subject because you have to put in something that you're an expert on, right? You want to know, I'm an expert. That's not very good. That's what we do for a living. 
right? But the other reason is by being an by giving it context, um, you you can then you're going to get a better answer. AI is a language model, right? These are large language models we're talking about. And so they're very specific to contents. Um, can everybody see my screen? I got a chat that somebody. Yes, um, we can see some... your screen. Okay. And Amr, if you want to re, if you want to re um, share the slide, somebody's asking for the, the slide PDF, um, which is up, fits up further in the chat. Okay. So, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take, uh, actually, let me, I'll give you, me finish the example. So I've put in, produced 20 ideas for how to, right, introduce students to Western music for non-majors. I've given them some specifics. I could probably tell them more about the students. It's a general ed course. They, they're only taking it to pass, you know, whatever. The more, the better. But so Claude gives me these answers, right? Music history escape room. That's an idea. Historical figure, social media, Mad Libs, music evolution timeline. Eh, okay. Again, I don't need 20. I just want one good idea. But now I'm going to go to Latimer. I ask Latimer the same question. Remember I said that Latimer was a different AI trained on black and brown sources? So notice how I get a different answer. Right? Notice it's number two here. Compare classical composers to contemporary artists. Fine. Highlighting how Beethoven's re revolutionary spirit mirrors that of artists like Beyonce or Kendrick Lamar. In other words, it didn't, it didn't give me you know, Taylor Swift, you know, it didn't give me, right? It gave me two black artists because that's what it, that's what it's trained on. That's how it thinks. It thinks differently. So that could be useful to you. So you want to try, I tried exactly the same prompt. I got very different answers. In this case, I got a culturally different answer. And then I go to perplexity and I put in exactly the same prompt, but this time the answer is different because it's different structurally, right? It thinks a little differently about the problem. So that's what I want you to do. And if you have questions, put them into the chat or you could, right? Um, but I want you to try the same. So customize a prompt and then try it in three different AIs. And if you're nervous about uh, data or you've not used a lot of AI, then use Meta because it's, right? And again, all those links are in that first page. So I let me know if there's a, if there's something that's not working. So there is the, link to the prompting page that has both the ideas for prompts and up at the top it has all of these links to the various AIs. Uh, for Latimer, you, you shouldn't have to, you don't have, it's free, um, but you, you know, most of them want to have you sign in with Google or a phone number or something, right? They want to have a list. I've never had any problems with Latimer or Claude. I've not, I don't, you know, I don't get advertisement, other kinds of stuff. Remember, right, if you use Amazon, Google, or Facebook, or you drive a car or use a phone, right, you've, you've, you've signed up for a lot of stuff. So, you know, and again, I, I understand the hesitation, uh, but Claude is, a, is the best free writer out there. Um, and I, I think, I, I th and the, so Claude is set up by people who left OpenAI to do something they wanted to be more ethical. And so I think what they're trying to do is to keep people who want to build nuclear bombs from using their AI. I mean, I, look, I don't trust any of these people entirely. <laughs> There's nothing that's no risk, but I do think that Claude is relatively low risk and et cetera. Jose, we, yeah, got a direct, it, we got a direct message asking if uh, within the field, if it's considered ethical to use like uh, AI grading software to grade students. Well, that's a moving target. Uh, I think, you know, the ethics of AI are just beginning. Um, my strategy is that if we're transparent about it, it I mean, is it ethical to use a, a dictionary? or a thesaurus, those are somebody else's intellectual work, is it ethical to use a spell checker? I think at some point people would have said, oh, you shouldn't use a spell checker. Um, but I think now we do. So I expect to see an evolution on this. Um, but I think this is a question that we're going to have to ask ourselves and our students. Um, so what I do is I do ask my students. I say, I have taught an AI to grade like me, and it's a lot faster. So you could have your 300 essays back this afternoon in about 30 seconds. Um, and I will read them and look at them and talk to you about all of them. Um, but it, 
it means I don't have to make all of those comments. Uh, and now that I've trained it on about 10,000 examples of my feedback, it's more consistent than I am. And it does something that I don't do. So I've struggled for years. I provide students with too much feedback. I know nobody else has that problem. It's just me, <laughs> right? But it's like, here are 12 things to fix, uh, which is like 11 things too many. So I, I've told the AI, just give students one thing to fix at a time. And that makes the feedback better. So I think it's better feedback because I was able to, and it's kinder, direct, but kinder, right? And it's consistently kind. Um, but I ask my students if they want that or not, and then I'm transparent about how the process worked and what I did. So, but I think that we'll come back to that when we talk about ethics and about cheating. Um, yeah, and I think that what, what Roxanne has proposed, you know, getting to having students get feedback earlier on is absolutely, I think, um, especially when they know what's happening. Um, yeah, and I think high school is changing. There's a lot of of, de of deliberate use of AI. When we get to, we'll get to some job information soon and you'll see that, right, this is the students who don't use AI are, are really not gonna get jobs. All right, so um, other comments about how this is working. And again, I've, I see the UDL comments. So look, one thing, another great thing you can do is here is my syllabus, right? And again, there's a little paper clip in mo on perplexity or copilot, right? You can upload a syllabus. Again, is it no risk? No, but nothing is no risk. Walking out your door is no risk, is risky, right? Um, but it's pretty low risk. I uploaded my whole book. Nobody, you can't get it out, and I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. Um, but I can say, here is my syllabus. Uh, how can I make my syllabus more inclusive? Give me 10 ways to make my syllabus more inclusive. Is there anything about the instructions that might be misunderstood by a first-generation student? Right? Is are there other readings that I could use from non-Western cultures? Right? There are all sorts of things that I could ask. Yeah, and somebody's already noticed that Claude is a little more nuanced than Chat GPT. So again, if you're if you're discovering things about if you're getting better or worse answers, go ahead and so so notice that it's like they have personalities. They don't. I mean, they're not, right? But um, yeah, so I, I, the, that I don't, you know, you're, try again. It, it says the link has expired. I don't know what that, you know. Um, yeah, Claude is a little verbose. Um, is anybody else having trouble or want to help your colleagues if there's a problem with a particular website? Um, so they do different sorts of things. Perplexity is connected to the internet. Claude is not. Any other observations? Problems? So I don't think it's going to make instruction jobs obsolete. I think, in fact, what it's going to do is the opposite, because there's no substitute for the human interaction, right? Having a person say, I believe in you. You can do it. Uh, I wrote a whole book on that. That's the previous, the yell, the teaching change book about relationships, resilience, and reflection. Um, so, right, the, we, we, all of you are people who are rational, or at least like to believe you're rational, because we're all academics. So we believe falsely that the way it works is that the person with the best arguments wins and that there's something weird going on when that's not the case. But in fact, the way humans actually work is we figure out who do we like? <gasps> You're on the lacrosse team. I want to be on the lacrosse. So I'm having a discussion with my students and I believe they're discussing a topic. But in fact, what's really going on is she's cute. <gasps> Everything she says must be true. That's actually the sequence that we actually, who do we like? Who do we want to be like, right? And so your identity determines what you believe, who you think it gets you, right? Which is why people believe people who are lying all the time, because they somehow get them somehow. And so so, so that the relationships are never going to go away. And I think that's, you know, that that is that guidance that that one on one is still going to be the thing um, that's 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 going to help us. Um, and so, Louise, so ChatGPT and Copilot 
should give you similar answers because they're both using the same brain, right? It's the same personality, the same neural network is giving an answer. Um, so I don't know what's wrong with Claude today. Uh, other people are, have, has anybody else been able to log on to Claude? Um, try it later when, I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, so other people are, you know, try meta for now or something else. Um, hmm, okay, so. And again, it could be that the camp, some campus IT people have done weird things and they've blocked some AI. Um, okay, so so we're going to do a whole lot of this next time. Uh, but I wanted to introduce you to this so that if in the next two weeks you want to play, you have a place. So I would try these different prompts. Um, I would try uh, some different things. And let me give you a couple of other ideas for just things that you could do that might not be so obvious. So there's the first one I've said, right, which is, um, right, new ways to introduce students to a topic. Um, but I had a PhD student come into my office in tears, of course, because she had written, she'd finished her dissertation. She sent it off to her committee. And the three readers of her dissertation sent back contradictory advice. One said, cut chapter two. The other said, chapter two is the only chapter that's good. More of that. And so, right, she's like, what's good about you? It's like, and, she, and then she says to me, true, she says, is this normal for you people? It's like, um, yeah, actually, this is how we operate in general. Um, so, um, but I said, so look, here's what you're going to do. You're going to upload your dissertation and all three letters into an AI, doesn't really matter which one, and then ask it to produce a table. So in the first column, list all of the suggestions your three readers made, but list them from easiest to fix to hardest to fix. Then in column number two, do all three of your readers agree or do they disagree? Then in column number three, if they disagree, what's the easiest way to make both of them a little happy? Done. She graduated. Right. So let me show you a tool. So so the um, here's how to do this in Claude. You can do this in Copilot. ChatGPT is working on its Canvas, um, but uh, so so down here on the left, you see when you, when I go to oh hang on I didn't go I didn't open sorry I forgot to share uh, here we go so when I'm in Claude I click on my name here right and and I go to settings right and so you should do this right and then I should enable artifacts. Right, that little button there. Uh, there's a similar in Copilot. You shouldn't have to do this. Just ask it to produce a, an Excel spreadsheet because it's Microsoft. Uh, in ChatGPT, it's called Canvas. Um, so there are various different um, versions of this, uh, but then it will produce that spreadsheet or that other kind of thing. Um, right, and yeah, we'll make sure that you get all all those links uh, shared. Um, anybody who wants to do that can do that. Okay. Um, all right, so, so that's another prompt. So some other things that you could try, right? I uploaded my whole book, the Teaching with AI book, and I said, so list all of the places in this book where I was redundant, where I repeated myself, or I had the same idea more than one, right? Just, just give me a list of all those things. I also said, um, I want you to check the book for citations. Um, are there any places where I forgot a citation and are all the citations in APA format? Boom, there was a citation that I had left out of chapter two. It said, you should probably cite this and here's the citation. And it was right. And the president of Harvard would have been very happy to have this feature, right? Because it, it, it was just a mistake, but there it was, boom, right? Um, so there are some ideas for some prompts, a few other ideas. Um, I, I want to convince my provost to fund this idea. Um, here are some her emails, some strategic goals, advise me how to make the proposal more compelling. I want, there's a trick here that I want you to think about. So I have a proposal from the Lumina Foundation that I'm now gonna send to my provost. So the basic prompt is, here is my proposal for funding from the Lumina Foundation, but rewrite it in the format my provost wants. It'll do that. Here's the form, fill out the form, do whatever. But think about the difference in this prompt because you're dealing with a language model. Here is my proposal for the Lumina Foundation. I want you to transform it into a proposal my provost will love. Why is that a better prompt? Well, first of all, I use the word transform, right? I used a verb that gives it more than rewrite. It's gonna rewrite, transform, right? It's gonna be, it's gonna transform. 
But the other is a, prov a proposal my provost will love is an instruction, right? What are the things my provost loves, right? It's going to do other kinds of work. Um, so think about that. those contexts. It's very, very literal. And I want options for a search committee in my department for people. I need this, right? It'll do that. Here are the, here is the, here's the departmental list. Just give it the website link. Look at the resumes. Um, who should, you know, give me three combinations of committees that have, you know, one woman, one Latin American specialist, one, you know, whatever. I could give it the parameters and then, right, it likes that. It'll do the department schedule the same way. Here's the, what professors want. Here's what students want. Here are the rooms, right? It likes multivariable problems. And then if you're really cynical, here is an article that I'm about to submit to the Journal of X. Who are the major figures in the field associated with the journal who might be asked to read it? And what work of theirs should I be sure to cite? Yeah, because we all do that. The defensive footnote. Um, right? So what we've learned so far. One, start with stuff that you know. You're the expert, right? Think about this. What do we do as faculty? We ask better questions. We evaluate answers. That's what we do, right? So start with stuff where you'll know if the answer is BS. Don't just ask it to write, right? Start with stuff you know. You'll be, have a better way to evaluate it. But notice that AI acts like a naive intern, right? It's not human. It's not thinking. It's not sentient. But if you think about it like a technology, right, it's not going to always be the same. It's like if I sent you a thousand naive interns to your office tomorrow, right? How happy would you be? It's like, well, ah, too many interns, right? But over six months, this is going to be really useful because I've got these people to now do all these sorts of jobs, but I've got to train them first. Plus, they're naive. They're really literal. It's like, so when I say to Einstein, literally, think about this. I got Einstein in my kitchen. Einstein, boil some eggs. How do I do that? Well, boil some water first. How much water? Oh, four cups. Exactly four. Yes, four cups, right? I mean, it's going to be really frustrating because Einstein is really literal. He's smart, but overly literal. So that's the way to think about using AI is like a naive intern, the more... Assuming it's literal, give it more context, right? Um, so that's the first that's the first point. Start with stuff you know, assume it's a naive intern, try different AIs, and you'll see that they have different personalities. Right? They don't really have different personalities, but they act like they have different personalities. Um, um, yeah, you can cut and paste uh, out both output and input, and right, you should be able to save things as documents, et cetera. Um, Oh, look, I like, and, and so um, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, when you give it, right, when, when you when you told it, I need a, I need three paragraph essay, I need it, whatever. Um, yeah, the more information that you give it, otherwise it'll it'll just do what it thinks is the average. Um, yes, and we will talk about plagiarism the next time. Be wary, free play, first of all, just the short answer is the free AI plagiarism detectors are useless. You got you to gotta pay for them. Those are only a little bit better, but the free ones are certainly worthless. worthless. Um, okay. So point number two, let's try this. Communication, empathy, wait. Like Grammarly for empathy? This comes from a Stanford researcher who um, did the next study that you're going to see. Um, so here's what he did. The 5,000 call center workers, um, and he, half of them got, had AI listen to the conversation and then make suggestions like, oh, no, no, this is how you solve that problem. No, no, you can't solve that. You need a supervisor or just, you know, the customer's in distress. Just shut up and stop talking. Just say, oh. And when AI did that, customers were happy, employees were happier, and more stuff got done, right? But there's a catch, right? Think about it. The, the senior people, the experts, didn't get as much benefit from AI because they didn't need AI, right? If I'm a really empathetic senior person, I've been doing this for 20 years, I know how to fix your iPhone, great. But the novice, the person who's been doing this six months, is like, wow, this really helped. I forgot all about that, right? So that's interesting. And so it turns out um, this result has now been repeated in a variety of experiments. And again, you can't read the little tiny print, but that's why you have those. Um, I will do it one more time. I will put the the citations and the slides in the there. So 
Some of these are interesting, right? So like when the vet calls you to tell you your pet has died, right? Nobody wants to get that call. But the AI was better at this. And people were happier, even when they were told it was an AI given, making the call, because right, the AI knows all about your pet. And your vet is like, I'm so busy. I got to get back to more patients. I, you know, I forgot what your, the, the, yeah, the Fido did come in when he ate that chair six years ago, right? But, but the, the AI remembers all that stuff. And so it's actually feels like you're getting more empathy. You're calling the, the, the peer supporter, the online kind of the suicide hotline, or you're calling your doctor. So this is a pretty robust finding that AI acts like it has empathy. So here's another example, which is weird. So when you've been to the doctor, maybe you've noticed, Oh, is that a hand up? No. Okay. Um, if you've been to the doctor, right, the doctor comes in with that cart and starts typing. And it's like the eyes are on the screen and they're typing. And it's like, so my doctor comes in for my physical a few months ago. And I walk in and the doctor comes in, he wheels on the cart and he puts, he, he moves away from the cart and he looks at me. He says, hi, good morning. It's like, who are you? And what have you done with my doctor? Why aren't you typing? And he says, I, I did say that. He said, well, so you know what all that typing is? Those are insurance codes, right? Those are the medical insurance codes for the insurance company. And so I've got to like put in a number for everything I do. And so the truth is I went to medical school, not insurance school. So I'm not really good at insurance codes, but it's what we have to do. So if it's okay with you, I'm gonna let the AI do the insurance codes because it's actually way better at it than I am. So notice he let the AI do something tedious and then he focused 15 minutes with eye contact, which you see in the slogans here of the various products, right? Maximize eye contact, see the patient, not the technology. Right. So imagine a student comes into your office and instead of you looking for your password and trying to figure out, I need to get into this system to check their degree readiness. I got to look into that system to see. Right. The AI just tells you, yeah, this is Steve. And you told Steve to take calculus last semester, but he didn't pass it. So he can't be a psych major. And the dog's name is Ralph. Right. And you had all of that just off offered to you as so to have a conversation and ask the student how he's doing. But and then. Right. A little bit of prompting. You could focus on the relationship. Um, and so those products already exist um, for doctors. And actually, they, something called ed sites already exists for higher ed. Um, but of course, there's a dark side, right? Um, so, be, right, AI is more persuasive than you or I. Why? Well, when I argue with my father, I do get emotional. I sometimes lose my patience. And then I become less effective. AI doesn't do that, right? So AI is better at getting people to change their minds. It's better at listening. It's better at reframing emotional situations. And all of these studies were done before for Omni, which came out in May. And so what you need to listen to, so this is a demo. So two things. First, get your phone and download the chat GPT app on your phone. Um, you will thank me. I, I don't, I, I know, again, privacy concerns. You've already got a phone. You've already got stuff on your phone. I think the risks are pretty minimal. Um, but you want the one that is official, the official app, which is the one that's a, um, let me get it here. It's the, uh, it's black on white. So it has a, it has a black circle-y logo on a white background. That's the official chat GPT app. Um, it works on, on both your phone and on, I mean, both iPhone and the other one, and Android. And uh, it does things that the that the web browser doesn't do. That you can't do, so, and at least for free, you can do things for free on your phone. All right? Um, so, and if you're paying for it, you, you're getting more voice, but you also get multimodal capabilities, which we'll talk about. So in this case, this is the, this is the demo where he asks the AI, he says he has a job interview. How do I look for my job interview? And the phone looks at him and can tell what he's wearing. And here's the- I just need to know, do I look- Can you hear? Professional? Well, Rocky, <laughs> you definitely have the I've been coding all night look down, which could actually work in your favor. Maybe just run a hand through your hair or lean into the mad genius vibe. Well, your enthusiasm is what's really gonna shine through. I don't have a lot of time. So I'm just gonna throw this on. What do you think? Okay, that's quite a statement piece. I, I mean, you, you'll definitely stand out, though maybe not in the way you're hoping for an interview. Okay, I got it. I got it. 
So emotionally intelligent AI is now here. Remember I said AI is going to change average. So here's the question for you. Not is that the most emotionally sympathetic voice you ever heard? The question rather is, do you know faculty that do not have that level of emotional intelligence? <laughs> right? So the question is not, right, is that perfect, but is it better than average? <laughs> right? And so that's interesting that that's the average now. Um, so AI can mimic your tone and, and the new chat GPT will, where it'll speak to you in accents. It'll do various sorts of things. Um, notice that I can change its, its aggressiveness. I can say, let's have a robust debate and it will be robust. Not so robust. Be kinder to me, right? Be more persuasive, but not, but nice. And so in the next couple of weeks, I would suggest that you try the app on your phone because, again, you get the emotional intelligence. You can have it look at you, uh, right? It will tell you where you left your glasses uh, if you leave it on, which is very strange. It's like, how do you know where my glasses are? Because you left them in the kitchen. It's like, I'm not sure I wanted to know that. Um, but, right, so so try that as another thing to try. And, again, we'll, we'll, we'll do more detailed things um, next time. Um, but think about other ways that AI could – modify your communication, right? What may, could this email appear insensitive or unclear to first generation students, to Latino students, to Muslim students? So my daughter uh, in the, who's a, in the, works for a company. And so she got some 360 feedback that her, um, her feedback was a little harsh and that was probably true, but it was a particularly sensitive Gen Z employee who complained. And so she now keeps on her desktop, thanks to her dad, a, a little thing that says, um, here is my email to a really super sensitive Gen Z employee who cries a lot. Um, make sure that my email is super sensitive and complimentary and not too harsh and reformat it for a Gen Z employee. Then she has another one that says, I'm writing to my boomer box boss who just wants bullet points, short as possible, right? But writing to the provost, here's the style she likes, right? Just get to the get to the point, right? And to make it shorter. So, right, she uses those, she says every day, right? But think about this. Suppose you wanted to practice for a search, an interview, right? And of course, lots of, of career centers are doing this. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I had a colleague who was going for a dean search. And so he said, here's the committee. Here's the job, the description. Here's my CV. What questions are they going to ask me and who is going to ask them? And he had a mock interview. And he, when he went to the real interview, he said it was exactly like the mock interview. The same people that the AI predicted would ask the question, asked those questions. So that might be useful. Um, so um, there are already a, a number of these for meetings, right? Zoom has one built in that will transcribe your meeting, um, but they'll also do some other things. Otter is a really common one. Um, so you might want to try Hume if you haven't, H-U-M-E. Uh, think about this, right? So most of those will transcribe, they'll say, right? But the one you just used on the phone, Right? It'll tell you who's interrupting the most, right? The Zoom AI will do this, right? Think about a think about a faculty meeting where you ask the AI in real time, tell me who's monopolizing the conversation, who's interrupting the most, who interrupts women the most, right? And display a graph of the names of the faculty member who's speaking and how much time they've sucked out of it, how much time they've taken during the meet, right? Think it, probably don't want to do that because it'll. Um, who's being passive aggressive? And it'll give you a, it'll tell you, right? So talk to Hume when you're alone, because it'll tell you, you know, you're feeling tense. So I'm not tense. I said, wow, well, you sound even more tense. Um, yeah. So, so every job is going to change. Every job. Because it doesn't mean jobs are all going to go away. I think most jobs will not go away. But this study looked at all 900 plus U.S. Labor Department jobs, because each of those jobs has a list of tasks. Right. So for every job, there was at least one task that could already be done better by AI. So I have an example. So I have two contractors who just finished um, because we had hail damage. And so I needed a new roof. I had some leaking. I had some people inside. So I had two contractors. So the roofing guy shows up, goes on my roof, takes out his phone, talks to his phone and says, you'll have a quote for your insurance company in 30 seconds. 
boom, the AI is going to do the quote. I've, I've told it, I've given it the parameters. It'll put it in the, your, your travelers, not since, right, here it is. But, so I get the right form for the right insurance company immediately. The other guy shows up. He does beautiful woodwork, but I'm chasing him for like six weeks. I need something for insurance. I need right, an invoice. So finally, true story. He takes a picture on his phone of a napkin, a napkin that he's written $525 on and his name. It's like, dude, I can't send this to the insurance company, right? So notice both of them still are going to, right? They're going to do roofing. They're going to do woodworking. But the one of them is using AI to make his job easier because he, he doesn't want to do the invoices, right? I don't want to do marketing plans. I'm a musician. I can have AI do the marketing plan. It's not going to do concerts. So it's figuring out what are the jobs, what are the tasks? So this study looked at Boston Consulting Group consultants and said, you, this group, do the work the way you've always done it. Do it by hand. Middle group, just copy and paste. Third group, you know, use AI, but try to make it better. Who do you think the clients like best? Which work did the clients, they, so all three groups sent their work to clients who then evaluated it. The work that was done by the humans, work that was done by AI, or work that was done both. Well, it turns out on average, the clients like the work done by AI alone. Hmm. Well, again, on average. Again, the same result we got before. So for the experience, the expert consultants, they were way better than AI. But for the junior consultants, you know, those all those consultants at BCG who, you know, graduated from Harvard six weeks ago, yeah, AI was better than they were. Right. And there were some tasks that AI couldn't do at all, ever. But the junior consultants couldn't recognize that, and the experts could. So that is our job. Which are the tasks that we need to do, and which tasks could AI do for us? And which tasks do students need to still do? And which tasks can students work with AI? So I showed you this result about physicians. This also suggests that, right, we're, we're reluctant to to let the AI do certain things, maybe it can do more than we think it can. So the question for you is, it doesn't have to do the whole task. Are there tasks where AI could do some of the work to get you started? Could it do a study guide? Could it do a rubric, a first draft test questions? Right, so try this. I have it, I'm making a test. I got a multiple choice test. I need 20 questions. Well, ask the AI for 100 questions, and then you can find 20 that you like, and then you modify 18, right? In other words, it could give you a pool of questions like those textbooks often used to do, right? Here's the study bank. I don't like all those questions. I don't need to like all of them, right? So is could AI do some of the work for you, right? Um, and so... Uh, and and so they they used uh, humans in that study to evaluate the the results. So the question for you is again, you're an expert. Is what are the things you reference letters? Absolutely, right. Some reports, accreditation reports, reports to the provost about learning outcome, right? All sorts of things that you could now. Again, I just need a draft. I need it in the right format. I need it to do. I need it to regrade some things. That's another way to think about this. And it's think thinking about the threshold of use. So I want you to think about. Um, the Kodak company. So Kodak had both of these products. Kodak invented the Polaroid camera and it also invented the digital camera. But of course, Kodak thought only the Polaroid camera was going to be viable as a product and not the digital camera. And so they stopped investing in the digital camera. Why? Why did Kodak, and of course Kodak is now gone, why did Kodak not think the digital camera was going to be so popular? We all have one on our phone and nobody has a Polaroid anymore. Yeah, well, part of it is they, right, they, were, they were making money on the film, right? But there was something else. It turns out that the early digital cameras weren't that good. They were fuzzy. So if you ask ChatGPT for a, an image of nursing school leaders when it first came out, you got this. How useful is that? Not. You gonna put that in your PowerPoint, on your brochure? No, it looks like a cart. That's not useful. I can forget about AI. But if you ask exactly the same tool, the same question 18 months later, you get this. Has that passed the threshold of use? That's your question for you.
So there may be something that AI can't do today or it couldn't do it six months ago. Six months ago, maybe it couldn't do your departmental schedule. But now it can because they're introducing new tools, new ways of doing things all the time. Um, all right, so let me do, a, I got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, um, and I live in Texas, which is where we get hail. We get Texas size hail. Um, AI best for creating a glossary. Um, so, uh, you know, I think for, you know, you could use any of the, so, I would use one of the big tools, right? The one of the smart, the, the big frontier models. So Claude could do that. Uh, Copilot, Gemini is probably going to be really good. If you wanted to also check, are the references real? But if you just wanted a glossary, and by the way, publishers are doing this now. Um, Claude, I think, would be the best just for a glossary. It's not connected to the internet. Um, all right. So work is changing. So this is depressing, but this is the number of freelance jobs listed on Upwork, which is a free, you know where, where people list freelance jobs. The number of writing freelance jobs has decreased by 30% since ChatGPT was introduced. Um, interestingly, not video editing. I think it's the editing bit, right? Because people are using AI, but that, and this is, this data is six months old too. Um, Here's other data. This is about um, the way that AI is, this came out from Gallup a couple of weeks ago, um, how people are using AI in the workplace and who is it the leader, the manager, individual contributors. Uh, and you'll see that consolidating information, automating basic tasks, identifying problems, right? Here's, here, is my, uh, here is my data from my customers. What don't they like about the product? Uh, all right, think about uh, here are all of my student evaluations, right? You have tenure coming up. Um, here are all of my student evaluations for the last five years. What are the top five things that I do well? And give me a, an example, a quote from a real student about things that I do well that I should put in my tenure, my, my teaching philosophy, right? Um, I'm still going to edit that, but it does analysis, um, right? But people are using it for productivity, efficiency, creativity, which we'll talk a lot about. Um, and then quality of the product, data-driven, that's that, that's that it, it can work without bias. Um, so we're seeing that AI is being adopted at work, but unevenly. I, I mentioned that HR was using it more than other people. The, the, the big data is that most of the AI use at work, aside from coding, which AI is very good at, is non-technical, which means it's, I need you to look at all these resumes. I need you to look at all this data. I need you to um, tell me what's how I could make my product better. Um, stress test my business proposal, right? Those are not really technical things, right? Those are things people are using their 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 words, using using their humanities. They're using social science, right? That kind of thing, um, right? Um, so to the question, I, I would I would say you're using it. I would I would be totally transparent about using AI at this point. A, we want to model to students what it means to have intellectual property. Remember, students have all been to the movies. They know what credits are, right? We give credit, just like we have footnotes. For when other people did the work, we provide a footnote. Um, you are not going to be copying and pasting a lot from AI. Um, you are going to be editing things, and so I think there's less danger. Um, all right, so. Prompting is weird. So we're going to practice it together in a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, um, try some different AI, try some different personalities. Um, but just start with what you know, right? Is this a good answer? Is it not? But do notice that small changes make a difference, right? Adding the word more innovative, right? Or giving it context. I want paragraphs. I want a 200 word response, right? So just a little bit of experimentation with that um, will start to give you uh, better results. But I want you to look at this, right? Does this look familiar? Who in the world, who, what people on this planet of ours do these two things? Asking better questions and evaluating answers. Well, you know who does that? We do that. And so AI literacy is really about the two things that we're already experts at. Right? And we're going to be able to help students. I need you to ask better questions because you get better answers when you ask better questions. But I also need you to evaluate the answers. So AI literacy, when we get to it next, it's going to be really both. It's both of these things. Right, It's both sides of the net. It's, it's before you run the prompt. Did you make a good prompt? 
what people are calling prompt engineering. But prompt engineering is only part of it. The other part of it is, did you get a good answer? Could you make the answer better? Could you evaluate the answer? So that's the bit that we're already good at. Right. Uh, so um, my understanding is we're going, are we going, we're going until half past, right? Is that somebody from the, yes, right? I'm, I've got that right, yes. good, okay. Yes. Um, I'm just making sure. Uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some questions in, in a few minutes. So, um, so I summarize this, technology is neither good nor bad, but it's also not neutral. Right. There are some bad things coming our way. I'm going to give you a demonstration. Um, but we've learned that every job is going to change, that AI has the ability to improve relationships, to make, make us faster. I, I think that our students are, are going to be asked to be faster and better when they graduate. So I need you to do the job. Right. Like my doctor. Right. My doctor is not going to be playing more golf. He will probably have to see more patients, but he will spend more time seeing patients and less time doing insurance codes, I think. So which tasks is our primary job? So I think that's going to be not just course changes, but curricular changes, right? Where do we introduce this topic? What do we give them senior year versus um, first year? So um, before I turn you loose uh, on, on the, the prompting for next time, um, a little bit about the ecosystem, right? So um, let me give you one example. So we've been talking about frontier models. So frontier models are the big six. There's a few more, but... Claude, ChatGPT, Gemini, Meta, right? So those are giant models, expensive to train, environmentally costly, but really naive, right? They, they're generalists. But there are other tools, and the one that I want you to try is um, consensus, which I'm going to put in here, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a, a deeper dive next time. Um, but here is the link. So consensus uses chat GPT in the background, but it also limits its results to what you get from the 200 million paper database of semantic scholar, which is in theory, the database of all of the published papers on the planet, but not Wikipedia, right? Um, so consensus is like a phone app right? It does things on your phone. So I'm going to give it a prompt and ask it to do something. We'll do this next week, but you should ask it stuff that you know, right? Um, it has a filter, which allows you to say, um, right, I, I only want certain kinds of studies. You should absolutely use the filter button, right? I, I only want these methods. I don't want those methods. So ask it, a, you know, ask it a question in your field, right? Something that inc should include your dissertation. See if your dissertation, right? Something, ask it a question where you know the answer and then say, how good are the results, right? So, oh, um, I want to know, you know, what is the, what is the latest research on something you're an expert on? And then you can do these filters, right? I can filter it by citation, by research type, controlled studies, duration, sample size, uh, it's in journal of this. I can exclude a journal. I can exclude Bob, who I don't like, who hates my work, or I don't like his work, whatever. I can do all sorts of fun things. So between now and the next time, try this and just see um, if it's good, right? So, and I'm going to get to the question about how do you keep track of all the tools? Um, uh, so, and, and by the way, if you don't like consensus, Elicit and Research Rabbit do similar things, but they are different. Um, so consensus, the, hang on, the, uh, the filter option, you may have to ask it a question first, but I think, I mean, I maybe make the screen a little wider, um, but uh, the filter button, uh, you, you can also ask the question first, and then once you get results, you can filter it. Um, so uh, that's, that's, but there's a whole range of these tools, and we'll, we'll try them next time. Uh, Elicit, Research Rabbit, do similar things. Uh, Notebook LM, which is from Google, which is all the rage right now because it allows you to upload your own data, which is kind of cool. Um, somebody mentioned Goblin Tools. That's another one. This is for neurodivergent students. Um, so it has very simple tools. Uh, I have a five page paper to write. What are the parts, right? How long will each part take me? So notice Goblin Tools also uses chat GPT in the background. So. Here's the answer to the question, how do I keep track of all this crazy stuff? Here's the answer. Um, well, the short answer is 
you bookmark my prompting page and I update that every couple of days. And so if there's a cool new tool for academics, you'll probably find it there in a few days. Um, but here's the, here's the better answer. So what you need to know is that there are these big six frontier models. These are the naive large language models. I didn't mention Grok, that's Elon Musk. It, it does have a feed from X, which means if you wanna know what are my students saying about me right now, that's the best place to go because it, it's getting the X feed. Or what's happening? What are people saying about the debate right now? You can get it get it on Grok. Um, so those are the big models. That's like using a browser. So when I go to my computer and I use Chrome or Safari, I can find a question like, oh, I want to know what percentage of flights in the United States today were late. I've got to do a, a Google search figure. What percentage? I got to go to the right site. I got to do some work. But if I want to know, is my flight tonight on time? And when do I leave for the airport? I don't want a Google search. I want an app. So the American Airlines app knows who I am. It knows what my flight is and it knows local traffic. So it's also connected to the internet, but it doesn't give me a zillion answers. It just gives me the one answer I want. So, the, so the, you need to know that there are two kinds of AI tools. There are frontier models, which is like using the internet, using a browser, I can ask it anything. And then there are apps. There are little apps. In some, one case, they're on your phone, but these are also websites. So the ones I just showed you, the uh, consensus, elicit, these use chat GPT, but they constrain the answers, right? They don't tell you everything. They only give you results from published papers, which is useful if you're an academic, right? If you want to do math, these are math tools that use Wolfram Alpha in the background. And so they don't have the AI do the math. If you want to do coding, GitHub has been fine-tuned. It also it has other sets of instructions. Um, if you want to do writing, Grammarly is one of these, but there are some others there, uh, Write Sonic and Jasper. And then somebody has already mentioned right, a couple of these. There's Magic School. There's a whole bunch of education ones. So everything that they do on Magic School, or by the way, in CoGrader, if you want to have your papers graded, everything that happens in CoGrader, you could do in your own chatbot on ChatGPT but you'd have to write a longer prompt, right? You have in the same way that I can find out if my flight is on time and what the traffic is to the airport using a browser, I just have to do more work, right? I've got to like type in what are all the flights, I have to know my flight number, right? I've got to do some work. So you're never gonna know what all the apps are, right? There's, a th there's tens of thousands of apps, but somebody will tell you, oh, there's an app that does that. So every once in a while you get a new app and you put it on your phone, but you don't have to know all of the apps. But you do have to know that apps are different than these frontier models. Does that make sense? So, so yes, you should occasionally, right? You should probably should subscribe to a Substack or an AI in education. You know, there's there are a couple of blogs and things. But but if you know that, oh, I, I'm gonna try Claude or Gemini, one of these big models. Oh, you know, what I really want is something more specific. I wonder if there's already somebody who's designed a bot. So there are a couple of places you can go do that. One is you can just Google, is there a bot um, for that? Um, but the other is you can go to chat GPT, which I think I have here someplace. There's Cone, where is chat GPT? Um, oh, well, you can go to chat GPT and you can, it says explore GPTs. That's what they call, it's like the Apple store, right? And they have, that's where their, where their apps are. Um, all right, so, if you are already confused, close your eyes. But if you want to know so the summary of that, so there are, there are frontier models, right? The, the big six. Um, some of them are open source, so there's really a big five. And there's also Mistral that just came out with a new model. So there are some open source models. That takes a little more work, but you can download them to your laptop. But And they're almost as good. Then there are all of these APIs. We'll talk more about that next time because there's lots of cool ones. But they're also customized bots, which are like, I'm a faculty member and I made this tutor and which your students could use it for free and people are giving away stuff. Um, so that's one. One that I like is called AI Tutor Pro. I will drop the, the link in that. It's in Canada. It's a group of faculty. It's free. Uh, so it also uses chat GPT, um, but it's set up as a tutor. So it does, it knows to not give students the answer and do kinds of things. Well, Zan, right. now we're um, coming down on like 10 minutes and there's a few questions in the chat. So I'm not sure okay. if you want us to. Uh, 
Yeah, hang Impressive. hang on to them. Give me give me just one more minute, and then we'll we'll go to those. Uh, there good. are also there are also some free there are also some mini models like the Apple Intelligence on your phone. There are some things which are not as smart, but they're they run on your phone. Um, all right. Uh, I would also put a browser extension in if you want to see what AI does all the time, and you just plop this in. So Google AI browser, whatever your browser is, Chrome, Safari, and then put Merlin or Copilot in, and then you will get AI answers to your Google searches all day long, which is, I think, useful. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that AI is changing average, uh, that the best humans, are, the experts are still gonna have an advantage, uh, but how are we gonna get our students to, to be that? Um, it means we've got to rethink grading, right? Do we Are we still gonna give Cs for the same work? How are we gonna deal with cheating? Right, what we call cheating, I think business is gonna call progress. So we have the whole session on cheating and detection and humanizers and policies. Um, but students are already encountering this data that people, they, they can't get hired. Oh, I didn't talk about equity. Um, so we will come back and talk about this, but there is an equity gap, of course, uh, but it's less racial and more gendered and economic. I'm not, it's a little bit of a surprise. Um, so we have to understand how that works. We'll do that in the third session. And then we've got to talk about creativity, which we'll also do um, when we come back. So let me, I've got one more thing to do and I will, uh, let's, so what are some of the questions? You want to hit me with a question or two or do you want me to scroll? Yeah, there was one that said, where is there a good place to start for those of us who aren't early adopters? I've been, I started with ChatGBT because I've heard a lot about it the most. And there was right, a so, few questions about, um, well, thank you, first of all, so much for the wealth of information. Um, oh, sorry. And, and there was a few comments also about like, there's so much information, like where do you recommend people to start who are not that familiar, who might feel a little overwhelmed by the quick changing world of AI and education? Yeah, so so the first thing I would do is is just right use the website I've given you, try the big models, right? Try Claude, try you know GPT, try it for different things. Try it for things you don't think it can do, right? Get a little experience, right? Ethan Mollick, who's who's written a great book, Co Intelligence, um, says that until you've spent ten hours with a model and had three sleepless nights, you really don't understand what it can do. I'm going to give you some more demos next time, and I'll give you more tools, and I'll give you more time to play next time. But but the start by just playing, right? Get it? It's, it's, look, it's just like the internet. I, look, I'm old, I was a cell phone resistor until I realized I could call my mother on the way home from work, and that was a good thing, um, right? But right, we had the same thing with the internet. So we're in the kind of Ask Jeeves stage, that, you know, the where it's like, which is it going to be? The Alta Vista stage of, of AI, right? We had a zillion things. It'll sort itself out, but you can't wait until we all get to Google in 10 years. So what I would do is start paying attention and look for things. Where could it make your life easier, right? Could it give me a draft of this? Could it do some reference letters, right? Don't, don't start with, oh, I've got to have six hours to do something. Just... Take a model, right? One or two. Claude is a great model. It's free. Um, and just try having it do stuff and say, make me a draft of this letter to the email to the provost. And then I'll edit it and see if it can make your life a little bit easier. That's my that's the, my starting place. And then come back in two weeks. Are there any other, there were several questions around that same theme. Um, if there's any other questions, anyone wants to type it in or ask it, we have a few more minutes. Yeah. So this question about, you know, essays. So the, uh, we'll, when we get to cheating, we'll, the, the take home quiz, you know, the, even in Blackboard or Canvas, you know, there are now extensions that will give you the answers in those. Um, uh, what my response is that we're, we're going to have to refine our pedagogy, but that motivation is going to matter. We have to explain to students, why do I want you to do this work? Right. It's just like push ups at the gym. Right. Everybody understands that the person who does the push ups gets the benefit. Right. My my teacher this morning said, you know, when when it's when it, when you start to be uncomfortable, the learning starts. Hmm. And if you make it too easy. So so we're going to we're going to talk about that uh, in the third session a bit more. Um, uh, all right. Let me give you um, any other. Yeah, I'm gonna drop the link um, for the future webinars. Uh, Jose, you have three more webinars, correct me, right? Um, yes, yes, more. yes. 
and they're on AI, but within different details. So I'll drop the link for that. If anyone is interested, please register. Um, so I've, I've got one more and, and while you're doing that, let me show you this because somebody just asked a question and I'm going to answer it in a perverse way. So another thing I, th I would do is I would start talking to my students because I learned a lot by my students say, oh, no, here's how I would do that assignment. I said, well, I, I, here's my AI resistant assignment. They said, no, 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 no. Here's what I would do. Um, so I start class or writing assignments with let's ask AI to write a, 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 a paragraph in academic style about why all college essays should have a character named Barbie in it or all novels or whatever. And it'll produce this essay. It'll sound in academic, right? With, but it's ridiculous, right? It's clearly, right, idiotic. So then I said, well, so how do you know it's idiotic? Because you're using your brain, right? You're being, a, et cetera. And so um, another way to demonstrate it would be with an avatar or, right, taking some of these, right? We have an election, right? Fake, new. we have all sorts of, right? These are all fake pictures, of course. Um, that have been used in the news, right? Somebody blowing up the Statue of Liberty, uh, you know. So, right, there's already this is already a problem. Um, and if you really want to know what it's like, um, this is not me. So, here for reference is Jose Bowen, and <laughs> I am making an AI avatar. I produced an AI avatar in two minutes. Apparently, I talk pretty fast. Now I can copy scripts into a box and turn them into videos in any language. I can make me say anything. So I typed so this. Could you. Uh, 首先让我们来看一下AI虚拟形象的制作过程. No, I don't speak Chinese. Wow. And I did this for, for a demonstration in Hong Kong, and immediately everyone starts speaking to me, and, 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 and oh, your accent is or this, and it's like, no, 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 no. So somebody asked a question about meetings. So Zoom is introduced, and this this is HeyGen. If you want to make yourself an avatar, you could use HeyGen. By the way, Morehouse did this for every faculty member. And then you upload your syllabus and all of your readings, and now it answers like me to students at four in the morning, right? You, you can control the content, and it's interactive. So you could talk to my avatar. And in fact, Zoom has just introduced this that you can send your avatar to a meeting that you don't want to go to, right? Did you know that wasn't me? I mean, right, the world is about to go boom, <laughs> right? So on the one hand, right, I, I've talked about so, some cool things, but so, um, right, AI is a skill. Can yes. I just add, I've seen so many people do these videos before and they're usually very scary and the emotions are off, but that was freaky, like how accurate. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, I apparently I twitch more than I would like to, but uh, uh, right, it it's not a good thing. Uh, but but yeah, so like AI is a skill. We're gonna have to at least get started. So that you don't it doesn't matter how many tools you use, just get some skill. But AI is also a baseline. Start getting used to what an AI response looks like, and ooh, that's pretty good. Oh, that's that's a C, right? And then we'll talk more about hey, AI, AI is a tool for creativity and learning and how we can make it better. Uh, but we also you should. Do not forget where we started, right? AI is also very, very dangerous. It has academic dangers, economic dangers, political, psychological. I, I predict that AI will have a negative effect on the birth rate because, right, who wouldn't want a, a partner who laughs at all your jokes and gets all your references, right? Um, I know, I, but right, I just, I'm just a prediction, not something I like. Um, so, but we should all be thinking about where does human quality matter the most? Are there tasks that I no longer need to do? And do what people need training? And the answer is yes, and here you are, <laughs> right? Um, but we've entered a new era of human thinking. And we did this before, remember the internet? We went from a world where knowledge was scarce, but mostly reliable, to a world where knowledge was abundant, but mostly unreliable. And we had to change the way we think. We had to change the value of, of skepticism. And so now we're having the same thing with thinking again. And so I just, again, let's, these are scary thoughts, but I, I'd like us to think about um, how we start. And so my, the ultimate advice is just start. It's not if you use AI, it's how. Getting, so getting better at it will start just by doing it. And so it doesn't matter which tool you use, use one of the top six tools in bold on my website, use perplexity, just use one of those tools and start talking and and see if it gives you ideas, gives you other ways to do things. Uh, and that's really the best advice that I can give everybody at this point. And with that, if there's a final question,
I think we're right on time. Thank you so much for this wonderful webinar and thank you everyone for attending. There was a few questions about what you uh, program used for the avatar, if you wanna include it in the chat. Um, yeah. uh, again, please remember to submit the survey. It's very, very helpful for at one and um, uh, keep an eye out for uh, three other webinars that Jose will be hosting. Um, and we have one more from uh, uh, Michelle Bukanski Brock. So please sign up for those and thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, we'll have the other ones are much more interactive. You'll have a lot more time to play with tools in the in the next one. Hey.